Hey everybody, ABC 10 meteorologist Brendan Minchef here. And yeah, we're gonna give an update on the drought. I also wanna show you more in depth about the satellite picture behind us. We'll compare it to last year. And then we're also gonna talk a little bit about groundwater and subsidence today as well. And how even though we've had a lot of rain this winter, it doesn't necessarily mean the groundwater picture uh, is all fixed just yet, still a ways to go. Uh, but let's take a look at the map, and there's been some very, very minor improvements. I mean, just fractions of percentage points here and there uh, that have changed. But still, 68% of the state is in no drought at all, about 24% of the state in that abnormally dry category, and then less than 8% now in the moderate drought category, which is kind of that peach color up near Siskiyou County, and then, of course, down in towards the desert as well. But most of the state now in that gray base map color, which shows there's no drought, and then that yellow abnormally dry category, also technically not drought. That's recovering drought. So still, with a score of 40, it's the best the map has looked since February 4th, 2020, when the score was 34. And again, the higher number, the worse the drought is, and it runs up to a scale of 500. So we're doing actually very well right now. Uh, we've basically eliminated just about all of the surface level drought that we had going into this past winter. What's left, the drought in far northern California, and also to some degree down uh, in southern California as well, What's left is that longer term stuff that takes longer to fix. It's not just a matter of filling reservoirs, right? It's a matter of actually replenishing uh, depleted groundwater, making sure rivers are back up to par and where they need to be, all that good stuff. So that's a longer term issue, which is why we've seen improvement, but also there's still some more to go uh, in those particular areas. As we look at our precip tracker, over 25 and a half inches of rain on the water year. Uh, that was just this winter, this water year, so October 1st, to September 30th, we are still about eight inches above where we normally are. And that goes for all of the state, really above uh, the average. Everywhere in blue shows you how above average that particular area is. So Sacramento, again, just showed it about eight inches above, but San Francisco over 11 inches above, same down in Santa Barbara and LA as well. Even in Northern California, above average for this time of year, which is some good news. Our reservoirs have also uh, really turned around since the start of this water year. Shasta at 97% capacity, Oroville at 91% capacity, and Folsom at 81% capacity. As we look a little further south, New Maloney's 63% capacity, Don Pedro 77%, and as we talk about the San Luis Reservoir, now this is an off-stream reservoir, right? So all the water in there either falls directly into the reservoir or is pumped into it. There's no really snow melt or anything that actually runs into the San Luis. There's no water, uh, no river, no stream, nothing like that that actually runs into either. So this is really a managed uh, a, a very controlled reservoir. So when we talk about, you know, flood risk or snow melt still to come, San Luis is pumped. It's managed by the state. So that capacity at 99% still a big deal because number one, it's full. But number two, that means we're storing a lot of water. San Luis is really a storage reservoir, right? It's along the California aqueduct, uh, which is good news, right? We're storing water. We've been able to put water away and we still have a lot of snow melt to go. And I know I said snow melt doesn't impact uh, the San Luis per se, not directly at least, uh, but it certainly does impact those uh, on the front range uh, of the Sierra and the foothills of the Sierra and up in Northern California as well. So the numbers to look at right now are really still the average to date, 200% plus of average to date in the Northern Sierra, about 250% plus in the Central Sierra and still above 300% uh, of that average to date down in the Southern Sierra. Still a lot of snow to go. Yeah, temperatures have been warm, so we've melted off uh, some of the snow that we've had, but there's still a lot left to go up there. Take a look at this satellite image. This was from April 27th, just a few days ago, uh, 2023. This year, you see all the snow up in the Sierra right now. A lot of it up there still. Again, this was taken April 27th at the end of the month, almost towards May, and you still see how much snow there is up in the Sierra. Also notice in the foothills and in the valley, it's green. There is a lot of green in the lower elevations as well. Not a lot of brown colors, right? Yeah, there's still some in the valley, but some of that's farmland, right? So it's not gonna be totally green. But then even as you look out towards the coast and towards the Bay Area, there's a lot of green. If we compare that to the same day in 2022, so just one year ago, this picture, April 27th, 2022, look at what I mean. Not as much snow up in the Sierra. In fact, hardly any at all compared to what we see this year. As you look in the foothills, it's still kind of green, but certainly not as green as what we're seeing this year. And then also in the valley and then along uh, the coastal range, there's a lot more brown, right? Things are just browner, not as green, not as much grass necessarily. Trees aren't necessarily as green. And then even out along the bay and in the coast, you see there uh, right in the Bay Area 
down towards San Jose, between San Francisco, San Jose, and right along the coast. Notice how green it is this year uh, compared to last year. Now, we do have some high clouds in the photo from last year. That's why it maybe looks a little foggy or, or something like that. Those are just some high clouds, but you can still get the idea. Green, not as green. <laughs> and that's what one wet winter can do uh, to the vegetation here. But like I said, it's been quite warm. We've had the warmest days of the year uh, really just over the last seven plus days. 93 degrees, the warmest we've made it to downtown Sacramento. That was on April 27th, the same day that picture was taken. Uh, April 28th, made it to 91 degrees. It's been 90 degrees twice. And so there you go. We've had four days in the 90s. Haven't made it to 95 yet, but the average first 95 degree high temperature usually happens a little later on in the month of May. So uh, we're still a little bit ahead of schedule in terms of some of those 90s, but that first average 90 degree day is May 2nd. So this is relatively seasonable heat, but still hot because the average high is just 77 right now. But again, that is helping with some of that snow melt. As we look back at the month of April as a whole, we started off cold in Sacramento, and then we shifted that weather pattern to hot. And this was really the case for much of the state of California. It started off below average and finishing the month uh, quite a bit above average, in fact. But that weather pattern is about to flip on its head. We're going to be much cooler back down below average. Instead of 10 to 15 degrees above average, we're going to be 10 to 15 degrees below average as we start the month of May. Very likely cooler for the state of California. This is from the Climate Prediction Center. You can see for May 5th through 9th, this is the 6 to 10 day temperature outlook. Very likely cooler. This is uh, not showing necessarily it'll be much colder in Southern and Central California than Northern California. It's saying the probability of it being much cooler is better for the Southern half of the state. But still, all of the state of California in blue, so very likely cooler. But also, look at this, very likely wetter as well, especially up in Northern California in the Sacramento Valley. But even that extends down in towards Southern California as well, where the likelihood of being a little bit wetter than average is there, right? Because that gray color is just the kind of 50-50 toss up. So those green colors mean, yeah, very likely wetter than average, which would be some good news. We'll continue to add some snow to the Sierra in the terms of about 6 to 10 inches. We'll continue to add some rain into both reservoirs and also just onto the ground, right, which can help with groundwater. And that's kind of the focus of this uh, particular story you're about to see. So high and medium priority groundwater basins is what this map is showing in the state of California. And most of them are in the Central Valley, which is probably no surprise to most of you watching this video. Uh, but then when we also look at the most critically overdrafted groundwater basins, look at that. They're right there in the Central Valley and really in the San Joaquin Valley from Stockton down towards Bakersfield, right? So that's where a lot of that focus is. And groundwater is super important to these areas that you see there, those or areas in orange that we saw. Those are the high and medium priority, right? Those are the ones that need the most help and also the ones that folks really tend to rely on the most. So the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA, is something that the state has uh, implemented and is requiring all local water agencies to kind of follow and submit a plan for so that we can help to recharge those underground aquifers and really hold that water in for when we need it and also to make sure we have it even in times like this where we have that surface water, but we also want to make sure that we're recharging and restocking that water that we're storing underground because there's more room for water storage underground than there is above ground in the state of California. And so groundwater, super important. But here's the thing, when we pump that groundwater out, right, in dry times especially, what happens is we're not replacing it, and so the ground starts to sink. That's subsidence. And that can have major impacts, not just on the ground and on people that live in those particular areas, but also on the water infrastructure designed to help recharge those aquifers. And you kind of can think of an aquifer as a uh... You know, in general, we think of sands and gravels and clays kind of filling up a, a, a volume of space and, and the voids are all filled with water. So as we pump water out of the ground, those clay minerals that are in all these random spaces will stack nicely together. And as they stack nicely together, they take up a lot less space. And so they compact is kind of the, uh, the term for it. And as they compact together, the land subsides and uh, that's called subsidence. But the ground doesn't sink evenly. Different amounts of clay in the ground, different geology, and even the type of pumping can make one area sink more compared to another. If as you have subsidence, all of a sudden there's a low point here, you now have water having to fill in this low point and then kind of continue on. So that kind of forms a choke point. So this canal that was um, designed to move water at this rate now cannot move as much water through the valley as it was designed to. 
Um, so the subsidence really affects the infrastructure and changes the slope and the, the storage spaces um, in the canal. Um, you can raise the um, sides of the canal so that you can get more water through it, or you can then just go um, change the, the bases of the canals and, and move things around. But also in these canals have bridges going across. And then you have the water starting to abut against the bottom of the bridge. So all sorts of infrastructure has been affected by these changes from the, the ground um, sinking differentially in different areas. And so we're having these canals and, and this infrastructure move this water around and get this surface water to where we need it. But we have this system now that can't move water as, as fast as we and or as much as we originally designed it to do. So there's been a lot of work being done on the infrastructure to improve it so we can move this water um, better than and, and even as well as we used to in the um, valley. Yet even with all of the rain this winter, groundwater takes time to recharge. It's not as easy as filling up a reservoir. The ground only can accept water at a much slower rate than just you know, putting it into a, to a reservoir. So it has to seep in through these sands and gravels and clays into the ground. We need to figure out how to deal with um, these more ex extremes. I mean, California has always had extreme weather conditions and wet years and dry years. Um, you can think of historical um, dry periods like the 76 to 77 drought or, and really wet periods, um, 1983 and different times. But um, this seems to be coming more and more extreme. And with um, all of the water usage that's occurring on top of this climate variability, on top of different changes in agriculture and what we're doing for crops. So in addition to the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, what will it take to future-proof California's groundwater system? We're likely going to need to build infrastructure to get water to areas that we can recharge well and rapidly. Um, we can think about where we're pumping water. Can we not pump water in areas where there's a lot of clays that are susceptible um, to subsidence and maybe deliver surface water into those areas and um, pump in other areas that are more gravel rich. So we can redistribute um, kind of our, our, our usage of water, but really reach out and work with the local areas and the local water agencies to figure this out. Because they know their system and what works well for them, and that may not be the same answer in one area as another.